Hey, it is good to see you all today. And uh, man, I love the I love the chatter. It's exciting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome, guys. How's everybody doing? We're good. Okay, awesome. Hey, listen, we are kicking off a new series today for three weeks called Hard Things Jesus Said. Do you guys ever read your Bible and go like, man, Jesus? Anybody in here? <laughs> that one hurt a little. Yeah? No? Okay, so you haven't read enough then. Okay, so those of you who didn't raise your hand, we're going to do a little special reading for you at the, at the end of this deal. But uh, hey, Jesus said some hard things, yes? Come on. Man, you go through it, you look at it, and you're like, wow. you know. And then you think culturally, he said that. Eat my body. If I said that to y'all, you'd be like, oh, dude, <laughs> ain't going to do it. <laughs> you got a little extra, so you'll be juicy at least, but there's not. <laughs> but no, he says some hard things, yeah? And so often, guys, uh, we, we read the word and, and we, we get tripped up on a verse or two and, and we go, man, I don't, I don't know what that means, but it's terrifying, eh? Right? It's, there, there's one we're going to hit in week three that's, that keeps most believers up at night, Okay. And, uh, and so we're, I'm excited to go through this, guys. But there's a reason that we're doing this, and that's because God's heart and desire is for us. Do you guys believe that? God's heart and his desire is for you. And his heart and desire for you is that you would have his heart in you. Yes? God wants to do a work here today, church. And I'm just saying, I'm excited for weeks as we've been preparing for this because I believe that God wants to do something so profound today. He says this in Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth... And the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, oh Lord. How many of y'all hear that verse and you're like, man, that's my prayer today, right? Man, the words that come out of my mouth things I dwell on, the things I lean into, the things I'm, I'm, I'm desiring and searching after. Man, guys, my heart this week has been broken because I want that to be true of my heart. I want my heart's desires to be pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. Yes? I want the words of my mouth to be pleasing and acceptable to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who sits on the throne. And so, guys, we're going to take this time because here's the deal. When Jesus is talking to us, when he says these hard statements, he's doing something with his words. He's doing something. And what Jesus is trying to do is he's saying, listen, I'm going to do some work on your heart so that what the desires that come out of your heart are pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. Yes? I'm going to do some work on your heart because James tells us that from the overflow of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. So Jesus is saying, listen, I'm coming after your hearts today. Are you guys willing for that to happen today? Come on, church. You guys are willing for that? Because I'm willing for that, and I need that in my life. So let's just go to our Father in heaven right now, because he's after our hearts. Jesus, we thank you that you speak words to us. You didn't leave us wandering around in the dark just trying to figure it all out, but you spoke words to us. And Jesus, sometimes those words cut right to the core. And God, I recognize this morning that when your words cut us to the heart, it's because you're trying to cut something off and add something in. And so Jesus, this morning, I just invite you here through your spirit to speak anew to our hearts, Lord God. We just lean into that church. We just, just lift your hands open to the Lord right now. Just receive from him. Just say, God, you have my heart. The word tells us the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Right now, we're just laying that heart at your feet, Jesus. Because we want you to do your work. God, would you seize our hearts today? Would you captivate us? Would you renew us? Would you transform us? And would your voice be the voice that speaks? Church, we just pray for me that God's voice would be the one that you hear today, not mine. Hallelujah. God, we love you. We love you. We're yours. We're here. We're bowed. Come and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll just stop there, okay? That's all I had. 
<laughs> no, it's good, church. Listen, hey, turn your Bibles if you have a Bible with you. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, there's one underneath a seat in front of you somewhere, okay? You guys kind of got the short end of the stick over there, but uh, some of you all over here, you have some Bibles. Um, it'll be on your screen as well, but Matthew chapter 5, I heard a study, church, that says people who bring their Bibles to church are 90 times more likely to read it at home. Come on. And now I'm fired up. So, <laughs> yeah. So here we go. All right. Grab your Bible. Matthew chapter 5. I'm in Philippians, so we're going to go backwards. Um, listen, guys, I'm excited for this because of what Jesus says just, but you have to understand a couple things about this text, okay? This is the Sermon on the Mount. Good job, guys. All right, so Jesus is teaching his disciples for chapters here. He's going to do this, okay? And oftentimes we read this kind of like it was one statement. It's possible he taught this for days, right? And this was recorded out of that teaching. But he's teaching with unique authority, that they had never seen before. He's teaching with, with truth that's just literally cutting to their heart, right? And, and doing work on who they are. And, and Christ is doing this in this sermon. A few months ago, a couple months ago, we went through um, the Beatitudes, right? In, in the early part of chapter five, all the way down through, you're the salt of the earth, right? You're a city on a hill. We talked about that. But right now we're picking it up in verse 17. In verse 17, Jesus makes this statement about the law that I want to read to you as we go through this text today. Okay, we're going to go all the way through verse 26, but we'll do this in chunks, all right? So here it is on your screens, page 760, if you're using one of our Bibles. Uh, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but what? But to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Okay, this is what Jesus opens with. He says, listen, I didn't come to abolish the law, right? He's constantly being accused of wanting to abolish the law, right? Because they're saying, hey, you're not doing the Sabbath right. You're hanging out with these unholy people. You're doing all these things, right? So he's accused constantly of coming to abolish the law, right? The law that they memorized and lived by. And he goes, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Yes. And he's going to point us to that fulfillment. But you notice what he says. He says, until not even an, an iota, right? Or a dot will pass away. I want you to see this next slide here. This is uh, the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. And uh, you notice I moved my hand from left to right because I'm English, but you're going from, you got me, right to left with that. You all read it? Perfect. An iota is the next slide. Check this out. Right in the middle of that guy there. That's an iota. The smallest character in the Hebrew alphabet, okay? The little markings you see underneath, those are just little, little ticks to kind of denote the sound that it's making. But that is an iota. It's actually a letter. It's called a yod. Say that with me. Yod, all right, you got it? Check this out. That's an iota. Now look at the dot. That's the dot. What's Jesus saying here? He says that written in the law of God, not even the smallest letter or the smallest part of that letter will pass away until all is fulfilled. Is Jesus serious about the law? Yes. Until it is fulfilled. And Jesus is going to make some statements now that are going to shock us. Watch this, verse 19. Therefore, listen to this, church. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Pharisees are amen in right now. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now they're standing up on the floor clapping, yeah? Verse 20. For I tell you, listen to this. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a hard statement. Now, on our side of the cross, guys, we think of the Pharisees. We, we think, hey, these guys who missed it, right? But when he is saying this to his disciples, what's he saying to them? Unless you're more righteous than the holiest person you know, you're not going to make it. Come on. 
unless you have more righteousness in you than the most righteous people you know, right? The scribes are the people who's exegeting scripture, right? They're writing it down. They're teaching it. These are the guys who, they're theologians. They're professors, right? These are the smartest of the smarts going, hey, listen, this is what you do. And the Pharisees are the ones living that out. This is how you enforce it. This is what you do. You don't do this. You do this. You don't do that. You do this, right? That's what they're doing. And these two groups of people are the holiest of the holies. These guys memorized the Torah and the Tanakh as as children to be able to make it to this place because they're so holy. They're so righteous. And the Pharisees are going, yeah. And everybody else is going like, there is no way. I can't make it. To be like him saying, hey, you guys aren't going to make it into the kingdom of heaven unless you're more righteous than pastors and missionaries. The ones who we think got it all together. (laughs) But unless you can live up to that standard, the one who teaches it, the one who's living it out, the one who's doing it over the world, the one who's got it all together, unless you're doing that, you're not going to make it, church. That is a hard statement. How could anyone be better? But here's the thing, church. What the Pharisees want to do, and often what we want to do, guys, is we want to make godliness, listen to me, we want to make godliness about behavior. Yes? Do these things. Don't do these things. Yeah? We want to make godliness about behavior. Right? Are we doing all the right things? See, the Pharisees are going, listen, we're doing all the right stuff. You can't find a flaw in us, right? We're not going to do this. We're obeying the commandments, right? We want holiness to be about external purity. Yes? I didn't look at that. I didn't go after this. I stayed away. I'm holy. External purity. But Jesus, church, Jesus is after what? He's after the heart. I want to keep reading here because Jesus is going to give him a black and white, plain as day law to say, are you living up to this? Are you more righteous than this? Check this out. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not what? Murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment, right? This is the law of Moses, right? One of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. Clear, yes? Don't kill somebody. Anybody in here today a murderer? Just, we all want to know. (laughs) Nobody? Okay, good. Awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't admit to that either because I don't know what the law is on that whole thing, so just don't do that. Um, Nobody in here has intentionally gone out, got upset at somebody at Walmart and decided to mow them down with their car, yes? Anybody in the room today? Okay, good. Temptation for that? Don't be on, okay, yeah, preach. (laughs) Every day. (laughs) So, not murderers, right? We've done it. Pharisees are like, yes, we've done it. We have not murdered. We haven't done that. It's very black and white. There it is, right? You shall not murder. Okay, check. Next one. Church, none of us in this room, hopefully, have murdered somebody. But listen, I want to ask you a question. How many guys are a fan of a well-placed zinger? Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The kind of one where you just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, what I mean? you know what I'm saying, guys? You're in an argument, you're talking to somebody, and you just knock them out cold with a phrase that just throws them back, right? And you're like, yeah. And then you're telling other people about it later, and you can say, then I said... And everybody goes, did you really say that? (laughs) Come on. Let me use that line before. Well, then I said. Well, then I said. Half the time we didn't say anything. We just stood there, yeah? (laughs) We love a good zinger. It feels good, yeah? Check this out. Churchill, Winston Churchill. I love this. The grand master of the rejoinder. What a great word made a habit of hoisting people by their own petrarch. You're like, that's awesome. A petrarch is like a small bomb. What he's doing, he's saying, listen, I'm going to take your war tactic and I'm going to use it against you, okay? He was brilliant at this. says this. He did it with his legendary response to Bernard Shaw, who had invited him to the opening night performance of one of his plays. Shaw sent two tickets, 
Quote, one for yourself and one for a friend, if you have one. <laughs> Churchill <clears throat> could not attend, love this, but asked if he could have tickets for the second night performance. Quote, if there is one. <laughs> You guys, that's good. That is classy British sarcasm laced in there. It's fantastic. There's a story about a man who got in an argument with his wife, right? And they're, uh, they're duking it out. And the wife always wins every fight. All y'all in here say amen? amen? Amen. All right, good. She's winning all the time. And so finally, he just makes a statement, guys. He just like sends it, right? And shocks her. And he's just feeling the glory of that, the shock in her face walks out the door and slams it behind him. Perfect exit, yeah? 20 seconds later to realize he's wearing no shoes, he's in the snow, and he doesn't have his keys or a wallet. <laughs> and she's laughing in the living room window. <laughs> we love a good comeback, yeah? I mean, there's something about our heart that just, man, when we, can, when we can make a comeback to somebody, we feel so good, it feels so righteous, especially when they deserve it, right? Going to knock you down a little bit, just going to peg you down, tell you what's true, and then I'm going to go on my way away, right? Make a grand exit. We love it. But Jesus doesn't love it. And he goes on and he says this. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother, listen to the word here, will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Bold. <laughs> whoever is angry at his brother is liable to judgment, just like whoever murders someone is liable to what? Judgment. You notice the phrase in there that says, whoever insults his brother, it's the word raka, raka. And it's to insult their intelligence, okay? It's to say, you're an idiot, right? You're cognitively impaired. You don't get it. You're not smart, right? You're dumb. Like, you're doing dumb things. You're a dumb person. It's to insult their intelligence. It's to insult their intellect. Say, you're not bright. It says, you fool. That's the word more. More. We say the word more, it's to insult the heart. It's to say, you scoundrel. You're corrupt. You're wicked. You're disgusting. It's to say that you are not worthy. Both of these words, guys, both of these statements say that you are worthless. In church, when we tell somebody that they are worthless, we are stripping them of their dignity. We're stripping them of their humanity. And to strip someone of their humanity, Jesus says, is to murder. And he uses this word again and again. It says that you're liable. Do you notice that? Liable to judgment. Liable to the council. Liable to hell. That word liable means that you're a slave to those things. When you hate a brother or a sister in your heart, when there's hate in there, to the point where you're going to call them names, you're going to defame them, you're going to malign them, you're going to tear them down. Jesus says it's murder. Let me ask you again, have any of you ever murdered? See, Jesus is after the heart. He's after the heart. See, we think we're good. We think, hey, I didn't actually run that person down with my car. I just called them an idiot for driving too slow. I'm good. You ever notice anybody is an idiot if they drive slower than you, but they're a maniac if they go faster than you? Come on. Church. 
studying this three weeks ago, I had to do some repentance right here. Because I'm guilty. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart isn't often acceptable, but oftentimes it's murderous. Yes. 1 John 3.15 tells us this, everyone who hates his brother, talking about this text right here, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Church, if we're murderers, we've got problems, and here we stand guilty. Some of you might have come in this room today and you're like, actually, no, I can't remember the last time I called somebody a name. I'm free from this. I'm doing good, right? But in the bag. Haven't run anybody over, haven't run them down with my words, right? Doing good. Jesus goes on. We can see this. Verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something, what, against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, when you first read that, you're kind of like, what does that have to do with what he just said? See, not only is Jesus after us in our own hearts, but he's saying, listen, part of the heart of someone who follows Jesus, part of the heart of God is to prevent somebody else from murder as well. See, when somebody has a fence at you, when somebody hates you, what's going on in their heart is murder as well. And Jesus goes, listen, you guys got to step up. You got to go to that person and go make it right so that they're not in this place where they're liable to judgment. He says, you got to go to this person. That's on you. So not only are you responsible now for your heart in this situation, but the heart of the other who wants to murder you. You see that? He goes on. 25. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny church. If someone brought you to court in Jesus' day, it's because they absolutely hated you. This is an enemy. And Jesus says, got to go to them. It's not about financial prudence here, (laughs) trying to get out of a lawsuit. It's about the heart. See, this brother or sister has something going on in their heart. They've got murder going on in their heart. And Jesus is saying, listen, you have to go to them and make it right so that they are not murderers as well. Because the heart of God says, I don't want anyone to kill the heart of God says, I'm going to go to my brother and sister. I'm going to try to make it right so they will be whole. A hard saying, yes? Churches were reading this. What Jesus wants us to see is that not even the Pharisees could keep the law. The letter of it, they couldn't keep the law. Because see, Jesus says that sin goes so much deeper, so much further than just the external actions. It goes so much further beyond just what I'm doing with my hands. It has to go with what I'm thinking in my heart. It has to do with what's coming out of my heart in my words. Sin has to do with the things that are in me that are coming out and going towards others. And Jesus says, listen, but I am after your heart. And so what do we do, church? Because here we sit without righteousness (laughs) on our own. Church, let me tell you something. God is after wholeness of heart. Listen to me, not actions of perfection. God is after wholeness of heart, not actions of perfection. Does that mean that your behavior does not matter, church? Everybody shake your head no with me. (laughs) God is wanting to do something in your heart and church. For this, we need Jesus. 
See, we can't have a righteousness that's greater than the Pharisees on our own. We can't even keep ourselves from those plain black and white things, church. We can't go down that list and say, I've lived up to all those things. I've transgressed. And when you take it to the heart level, we've, we've transgressed every single one. Not one of us is blameless. And God is after our righteousness, but he's after our heart and church. For this, we need Jesus. How many of you can keep somebody else from hating you? Like a special gift? <laughs> All right, how many can go turn an enemy to favor you? How many of you can keep your own heart from tearing down another person you're called to love? Or somebody you don't even know? or a government official. See, church, Jesus is after our hearts, and some of us have been trying to change our hearts for so long, and trying our own, right? Man, I'm, I'm just not gonna say it. I've done a good job. I didn't say it this time. Yeah, anybody here? <laughs> Woo, but man, did I say it, <laughs> right? We need Jesus. We need the Lord to grant repentance. And so church, today, right after this, right now, in this moment, what I want us to do is we've got to recognize that it's Christ who wants to do heart work on us. If the Spirit of God's been talking to you, you find yourself in here today, you're guilty of this. Listen, the Lord wants to work this out with you. He wants to deal with this with you because see, the truth is, church, nobody can be righteous enough, and that's why Jesus came, and that's why the law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because we couldn't keep it, but he did. Hallelujah. Church, it's all about Jesus. See, the gospel says that your unrighteousness, Jesus took on his body, bore it in his flesh, died on a cross, rose again to defeat that, and then gives you a name when he says that you are righteous. He calls out to the one who believes by faith in him and says that you are declared righteous. This is called justification. That you are declared righteous. And it is Christ's righteousness that now rests on you. Do you guys understand what that means? It means that you're guilty of murdering somebody. And Jesus is granted with bringing somebody back to life. And Jesus looks at you and says, no, I bore that guilt. You're not guilty. But you're not neutral here anymore. Because see, the life that I saved, I now credit it towards you as righteousness. You gave your life. You give life. You're granted righteousness. You are declared to be righteous. This is phenomenal. Jesus fulfilled the law, the letter, the dot of the law, because we could not do it, church. And so right now, we're going to take a moment just to meet with him. So we're going to have the prayer team, if you guys would. We're going to have a couple people over here to pray. We're going to have a couple people over here to pray. We're going to take a moment. We're going to worship. We're going to spend some time with Jesus because this is who we need this morning, church. We need Jesus in our heart to do some work in our hearts. And so maybe you're here a believer today and you've been struggling, man. You've been hating somebody. You've had these words of anger. You're just letting that out on whoever. Your desires are warped right now. I want to invite you. Listen, if you need prayer, go get prayer from one of these people. They've been praying for you all week long. I'm praying for this moment that God would break off something in your heart because listen, church, we can't do this on our own. We need Jesus. And so God brought us into this place to do that work today. And so I wanna invite you to do that. We're gonna sing a song. And while we sing this song, you can worship however you want to. You can sit here, you can stand, you can kneel, you can do whatever you need to do, but take this time with the Lord. Go pray with somebody. Pray with someone near you. Ask God to do a work in your heart because we need his heart, amen. He's after our heart. And it's his heart that we need, church. Let's go ahead and let's do this now.
Lord, so it's a good place to do that. We need the body of Christ surrounding us in this process. He didn't put you here alone and just say, hey, it's good enough for you just to have my spirit. He says, no, it's, it's you need community in your life. You need brothers and sisters to come around you, to help love you, and to support you, and to bear this burden with you. And so, church, if you're struggling with that today, I just encourage you, come get prayed for. Take this moment to just solidify this with the Lord, to say, God, I want you to purify my heart. I want to be more like you. Jesus, we want less of us. We want more of you, Jesus. God, we need this in our heart. God, we stand here today not as people who have got this in the bag, not as people who get this fully, but God, as people who need you. So Jesus, I'm asking this morning that you would start moving in our hearts so that the words of our mouth the meditation, the things we dwell on, the things we think about would be holy and would be pure and would be pleasing to you, Jesus. Would you do this, Jesus, we ask.
gospel says that we couldn't do it, but that you did it. Thank you, Jesus. When so many of us were worthy of hate, you loved us. worthy of being rejected, you said, no, come here. Jesus, would you do this work in our heart? We want to be your body. We want to be your bride who lives for you, who loves like you, Jesus. Someone more of you and less of me Jesus, I just want to be like you. And I want more of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. Jesus, I just want to be like you. want to be like you. Make us holy and pure. Thank you for saying we are. Thank you for meaning that. Thank you that we stand before you as believers, not as guilty, but as righteous because of who you are, because of what you did, Jesus. We bless you. We lift your name high, Jesus, and we love you, church. Our church says, amen.